Hello and welcome. My name is Dan Meyer. I'm the editor in chief of RCR Wireless News. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, Dolly Wire. This is CTO uh, Sean Stapleton. Sean, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. I appreciate being here, Dan. Great. Well, maybe start off with, I guess, a little bit, uh, maybe some background on the company. Maybe for those who don't know much about you guys, just give us some some background on uh, what you guys do and kind of how you guys play in the in the wireless space. Sure. Absolutely. It'd be my pleasure. Um, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, I'm the CTO and founder of Dally Wireless. I have a partner called Albert Lee, who's a co-founder. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a, a serial entrepreneur, whereas uh, my background is more in academia. I came from a, a, a university up in Vancouver, British Columbia. So uh, uh, Dally Wireless was founded in 2006 uh, in Silicon Valley, um, where our headquarters are in Palo Alto, California. And our R&D facility is actually in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, believe it or not. So uh, we're uh, uh, in uh, North America. The space that uh, we operate in uh, is uh, uh, the what you call the DAS, uh, traditionally DAS space. And what uh, we've developed is we basically revolutionized the, uh, that entire space where we're we're bringing intelligence to uh, to DAS systems. Mm -hmm. um, we have a technology called RF router, and basically uh, that domain has been relatively stagnant, using old analog technology and using passive uh, 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 remotes as well. And so, uh, what what we've done is we kind of looked at it holistically um, and, and try to put some intelligence into the uh, uh, the network. And you can think of uh, our platform a lot like Cisco's IP router, if you will. Mm -hmm. That's a good analogy, probably. Where we would uh, take in uh, uh, RF uh, signals uh, from the base station, or we can take in digital signals from the base station, and we can even take in IP data uh, as well. And then we pass this through our what they call our T-host, which is our RF router. Mm -hmm. And we packetize all that information and provide it with a given header, so an address to send, just like a, a traditional uh, 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 Cisco router. And then we send that out over our network. And uh, our network is basically, you can think of it as an N input to M output. We mm -hmm. can have scale the number of inputs, scale the number of uh, outputs as well. And so we then route these packets to uh, the various remote units, uh, and uh, we we have a, a seamlessly integrated low power. If you have an indoor space, you want to uh, get coverage in, and we have uh, high power. We have uh, digital signal processing techniques that allow us to do DPD to have very small form factor uh, high power units. Okay. Well, obviously, and I, I mean, I know from covering the DAS space for several years now, that has been kind of, I guess, one of the issues with DAS has always been, it's been looked at as being uh, not a not a uh, unintelligent network type of thing, but it, it's, it's, it's kind of almost, you know, almost not, not a passive thing, but just not as intelligent as perhaps uh, maybe, maybe more, you know, new technology in small cells and things like that. So DAS always has seemed to be kind of maybe perhaps behind the times a bit in technology. It seems like what you guys are doing is bringing it maybe more up to speed and maybe more more modernizing of the of, of the DAS networks. Absolutely, I think you hit it. Uh, you hit the nail right on the head there. Um, so uh, again, uh, it really hasn't uh, that space really hasn't evolved much over the years. And you know they were just using high power units blasting through RF cables, getting coverage. Yeah. And so they they didn't uh, they didn't look into well how do you bring capacity to bear in this because with this mobile uh, data traffic explosion, you need something a little bit more intelligent so you can focus your uh, resources, your base station resources, sector, uh, doing sec clever sectorization, into uh, high density areas where mm -hmm. there's a large congregation of uh, users. So, they, so yes, absolutely, we have intelligence in our remotes and in our hosts to uh, enable uh, that type of, uh, of uh, routing of the given packets from the base station. Um, and there's one little, uh, a, ni a nice little feature we have as well is, uh, and this is our, 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 the platform that's coming out uh, in Q4 2014, is it's called our high density system. 
and it's it basically amalgamates about 300 megahertz of RF spectrum. So this this is this is great for all the operators when they have multiple bands. They got 700, 850, 1900, 2100, 2300 megahertz, and uh, in addition to that, they have MIMO as well. And so you need basically double that bandwidth. And so we can take that 300 megahertz of RF spectrum, okay, and transport it over optical fiber and, or basically route it to various uh, remotes and at a rate of approximately 10 gigabits per second, wow. which is, which, uh, um, is a standard that uh, the operators are kind of targeting. Is yeah. they want to upgrade their network to to operate close to 10 gigabits per second. Yeah, interesting. Well, and obviously, you know, again with with kind of uh, carriers like you mentioned, you know, having all these different spectrum bands, and they're, they're definitely compiling more and more spectrum uh, to meet these uh, these demands from, from consumers and data services. Uh, being able to be able, you know, have something that can support that seems like a pretty important uh, aspect right now for for, for carriers too. Yeah, a absolutely, no question about that. Uh, um, the uh, you know the MIMO is a, a tricky one, and yeah. you know because uh, you know, traditionally with analog systems, you the commissioning and installation is a nightmare. You have uh, your signal to noise degradation uh, over the length of the uh, the fiber because of the the laser and the avalanche photodiode, which limits its its range. And so you know, just like all uh, all communication systems have eventually shifted to digital. So you're sending ones and zeros, so you can get reaches out to 40 kilometers. Which allows you to put your base station hotel instead of downtown New York, you you send it off in uh, uh, you know less expensive real estate areas, mm -hmm. and then pipe in that capacity into where you want it, when you want it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Well, I guess I guess what I mean. Obviously, it sounds like the technology you guys have is pretty advanced. There is that kind of your main difference, you'd say, between yourselves and perhaps maybe more traditional DAS players out there, is that you're able to to you know provide this maybe more intelligent. Uh, a higher capacity uh, service right now? Yes, yeah, so there's a, actually a couple, a couple parameters that uh, really set, a, set, set us apart. You know, the RF routing capability. And if, if you were to visualize a number of base stations from various operators, or for that matter, a base station with multiple sectors. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you take those uh, multiple sectors or those multiple operators and basically uh, uh, combine their spectrum and transport that over a single fiber because there's a lot of venues that have limited number uh, of fibers out there, uh, strands that you can utilize. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we enable the uh, basically cascading of the hosts that reside next to the base station. And this enables each operator to have their independent control of, of their signal Okay, and then you combine them through the cascading of the hosts, uh, combining that signal and then piping that out over a single fiber. Um, and it, you know, one one thing I, I you know along the lines of the MIMO, because if you have multiple sectors or you have a MIMO, you want to be able to have two hosts for mm -hmm. or three hosts if uh, 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 if it's three sectors or or. Two by two MIMO, you're going to need to have two hosts. You need to be able to uh, combine those signals and transport that uh, to the or route that signal to the remotes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it does seem like that obviously MIMO has become uh, an increasingly important part of networks. I mean, obviously, as carriers are looking to get as much capacity as they can out of their spectrum bands, uh, MIMO is, is again one of those tools in the toolbox. But it does seem like there's been some uh, perhaps some challenges with MIMO because again, it is a pretty it seems like a pretty complex technology. Uh, that a lot of companies are still uh, struggling with, it seems, uh, trying yeah, to really get it, in a, especially in a commercial setting. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I can give you a good uh, uh, use case of that. Um, the uh, uh, as an example, there's a there's a, a spec uh, AT&T has out there. It's if you look at a MIMO for just a two by two, you need to have um, your the signal time aligned between the two antennas to within, I think their spec is like 65 nanoseconds. Uh, because we, we do it digitally and we have uh, loopback delay uh, uh, compensation, we basically calibrate, auto calibrate our entire network. Mm -hmm. We're we can get the two antennas transmitting within a 35 nanosecond uh, delay. And so, so what happens if, especially with analog technologies, technology that's almost impossible to do, 
But digital technology, even if you start to slide beyond that 65 nan nanoseconds, basically the impact on the user is a lower throughput. Mm -hmm. So you can't get, uh, uh, as an example, one of the, uh, uh, the hotels where we installed in LAX, um, they were, we put in a 2x2 two two MIMO system into the air. It was at and base station uh, in, in the basement of the hotel. And we were getting 60, uh, 60 megabits per second uh, downlink and 40 megabits per second uplink. Um, so, you know, the technology is there. You just got to, uh, you know, all, know all these uh, nuances with uh, uh, dealing with MIMO. Yeah, and I, it doesn't, like you said, MIMO is one of those technologies where uh, if you don't get it quite right, it can be very almost a detrimental to a network. I mean, it's like if you, if you don't get it on the right side, it becomes a, a major hindrance to what you're trying to do. So, um, uh, precisely, precisely. Yeah, that's tricky. Well, now well, I guess you know it does seem like there's some some virtualization aspect of, of this as well um, to your offering. I mean, can you, I guess we touch a bit on the importance of uh, I guess the growing influence of virtualization uh, for operators. You know, it's still kind of a new a, a new space for a lot of operators, especially some of the older legacy guys out there who don't like to change too much, but uh, uh, you know, I guess that, that aspect of how virtualization is impacting uh, what you're doing, what you're seeing maybe across uh, across the space. Yeah, sure, yeah. No, that's, uh, um, we have a, a feature in this, our high density system that's, uh, again, coming out this uh, uh, fourth quarter of 2014, that's a thing called uh, dynamic capacity allocation. So this is a patented technology that we've developed over the years and it enables basically virtualization of your remote units. And the way to envision this is that, say you have multiple sector base station um, that uh, is uh, connected to your hosts, and you, if you have the flexibility on the remote units, which you know a remote unit uh, uh, provides coverage for a given space. And if you can expand and contract that space, okay, which they virtualize that uh, that cell if you want, so you can, uh, especially for you know high density areas, maybe coming you know at a train station or a bus depot or food court in a mall, if you can actually focus uh, um, a single sector uh, at a specific uh, a point in time in that zone and then when people migrate back to their offices or away and then reutilize uh, uh, that capacity that you focused into a larger geographic area you're making obviously a more efficient use of your base station resources and then you can move that around example maybe it's like a football game where people are uh, uh, people are uh, having a tailgate uh, a party you know having their barbecue in the parking lot prior uh, uh, to a football game, you have your sector focused in on that zone, okay, and you put, uh, and then you basically, as they migrate into the stadium, you move that capacity into the stadium. Obviously, that, uh, that uh, the impact is that you don't have to over-provision your, your system. So that's basically virtualizing your radio access network by uh, allowing that capability. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm seeing a lot more demand from uh, carriers for this. I mean, it does seem like it's, a, it's an idea that has been talked about for a while from carriers. I mean, you know, they, I mean, it seems to make sense financially, operationally, uh, but again, you know, carriers are uh, somewhat slow moving at times. Uh, but are, are you seeing that, that, that demand for this kind of virtualization, this ability to, to more dynamically allocate these resources has become... Uh, perhaps more important to carriers is it, is it kind of is it, is it migrating up the up the sea level food chain perhaps quicker uh, over the past you know six months than it did perhaps over the past few years. Yeah. Um, so you, the you know doing it indoors in an indoor environment like a convention center like a, a mall or a hospital or any type of enterprise uh, um, there's a a lot more flexibility. If you start dealing with the outdoor space, there's, there, you know, they're definitely moving cautiously forward on that because you got to be aware of the base stations around the system. So it, I think it depends on the application where it's applied. But uh, definitely, we see, uh, you know, and this, if you think about it, this is actually resectorization has been around for a long time but traditionally you'd have somebody going out there you know changing cables changing the plumbing uh, so manually and so now we basically can do you can do that remotely via software 
uh, you can reconfigure your system. So we're just providing the tools that uh, uh, to enable this feature and the hooks in the system so that if the operators want to take control of it, they can. Yeah, yeah. And I guess bringing it back, I guess, as a final question, back to kind of the DAS atmosphere, uh, you know, virtualization in a DAS environment does seem like uh, it's kind of, it, it seems like a, it's like it's made for it. I mean, because, I mean, DAS are obviously kind of shared resources in a lot of, a lot of cases. And being able, and for Carrier to be able to dynamically control its part of that, of that resource, uh, it, it seems like it's a, pretty, it's a pretty handy feature to have. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, you know, I think you, you, know, you touched on it. Uh, one of the, the strengths of, uh, you know, this RF router technology that we have that's replacing uh, traditional DAS yeah. is that it does have the share infrastructure. So you have, you know, uh, you're basically agnostic to operators, uh, frequency bands, technology, you know, 3G, 4G, uh, et cetera. Um, so you, you, you do have that, definitely have that flexibility in there. You know, one other... Uh, uh, interesting aspect to just to carry on with uh, what you mentioned is uh, having the ability to uh, scalability to seamlessly upgrade, especially uh, enterprises that have uh, regulation or requirements for public safety. If you can uh, have a, a structure, infrastructure in place like our RF router, and then you can just easily add on public safety at a later date. You know the 150, the 450, the 700, the 800 bands. Uh, obviously, uh, as the needs for that uh, uh, or the regulations come into place, you can add that on. You know companies love that. And, and the other thing is, okay, we have, as I mentioned early on, we have this uh, IP. Uh, data pipe over our network. You know, the Wi-Fi guys love this because now you can uh, connect up, oh, there are remotes, you connect up the Wi-Fi access point or you connect up IP cameras at the remote units and they're all uh, power over Ethernet um, and using the same infrastructure. So, you know, again, we looked at, we, we basically looked holistically at that, what was traditionally a DAS space and we brought some intelligence into it. Yeah, and I think that you guys are looking, kind of looking forward as well. I mean, the scalability aspect of this, of this seems pretty important because, again, uh, the, it, it seems like innovation when it comes to wireless and use of wireless networks uh, is advancing, I think, much more rapidly than most of us ever thought it would. And uh, it seems like uh, you have to definitely be future, future proofing a lot more now than perhaps you had to do in the past. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. Um, you know, even uh, giving another example is that, um, you know, we have the capability to uh, pipe in RF signals directly into our units, but with switching out a card, you can then actually come directly from the BBU, from the base station, directly and digital into our units. And additionally, you can come in uh, via an IP Ethernet uh, port as well. Um, so we're making the system flexible so that uh, as the operator's needs evolve, we can actually... Uh, uh, change out modules and basically scale and have the flexibility to scale uh, with their needs. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. Well, hey, Sean, we definitely pre appreciate the insight today. And obviously, uh, the big news you guys have coming out for later this year it should be uh, interesting to watch. And uh, again, we thank, thank you so much for, for the time and insight today. Uh, it's a pleasure talking to you, Dan. All right, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. Okay, have a good day.